Okay, good morning um, and welcome to the AFI group of webinar on CPA terms and conditions. Um, hope you can hear me everybody, if you can't, the, you can see there's a question drop, you can highlight that and tell me that uh, you know if you've got any issue, issues or difficulties. Um, my name is Brian Parker, I'm the business development manager um, for the AFI group of companies. I, I sit on the technical side um, and, and offer support to the group. Um, so. The chosen topic today is CPA terms and conditions, um, and and really, what are you signing for? Um, and and you know, appreciate you, and, and thanks very much for for, uh, for listening in. It's a it's a difficult topic because I think we've all gone on holiday, we've all bought something, and uh, you know, and you, you click on the bottom of there where it's car insurance, or you know, what are you actually signing for? And you know, and and how many of us can be guilty of actually not reading the small print, uh, and, and not actually looking at what we actually were signing for? Um, and what the, you know what what potentially are the uh, the misgivings a little bit later on should something um, potentially go wrong or, or somebody ask questions. Talking of questions, um, if you do have any questions, you know please feel free to ask them. I do often get questions sent afterwards. Um, you know for those who don't want to ask questions uh, during the webinar, you can just type your question in there. I'll, I'll endeavour to do my best to answer them during the time, um, and those of course which I can't answer during the webinar and I may need to go away and just have a look at it and research something, uh, then, I, then I'll come back to you. I'm aiming to do this webinar and finish this webinar in around about 45 minutes, um, and then have a little short Q&A at the end, and then bid you farewell. So, you know, appreciate you listening in, um, and uh, yeah, let's hope we can uh, we can go through some. There's a little bit of a learning curve, hopefully, for you, some of you in the room, uh, in, in your places of work, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll get something out of today. So, forgive the picture. Uh, but a little bit about myself, um, as you would expect, I've got the various um, safety side of things. But I do sit on quite a few committees and groups which represent MUPs in the industry, um, namely the Strategic Forum Plant Safety Group, which meets um, two or three times a year. That's a CPA-backed um, group in, in uh, collaboration with IPAF. Uh, also, a BSI committee member for the rewrite of the BS8460, which is the Code of Practice. We've just kind of finished that, and it should be coming out for, for uh, public comment uh, in the not too distant future. Um, IPAF, I've sat on IPAF now for, for as long as many years as I've been an instructor, really. So, um, you know, being training committee chairman, um, and as you would expect, you know, I'm heavily involved with that country council member as well. Um, I'm also involved with PASMA training committee. I'm the vice chairman and the Higher Association Europe Health and Safety Technical Committee and various other little things there, so as you can see. So that's enough about myself. Um, agenda today, um, quite a, quite a, an in-depth agenda in that sense. Um, you know, I'm going to try and translate what we've, what we've got, these T's and C's, into a simplified form, you know, and what terminology is actually used. Um, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, is that for me? Is that for them? Um, you know, highlight main points: the CPA, you know, where it protects the plant owner, um, the company, hire company, and what it means to the owner, and obviously what it means to your good selves as, as potential hirers, uh, and the limitations of, of your responsibilities, you know, including the equipment that you hire. Um, and we're going to go through these areas here that you can see there, and hopefully you can you can get a feel of what what I'm trying to, to look at. So, first and foremost. Um, some of you may have heard of the CPA, um, Construction Plant Hire Association. Um, these are basically this is uh, the CPA itself has been in existence since 1941. Um, has over 1,600 members in the UK uh, and and Ireland and such. Um, and with premises in London, permanent staff, experienced employees. Um, the association is governed by a council of members who essentially represent plant hire companies of all types and sizes throughout the country. Now, the UK plant hire industry is the best established and most professional in the world. Many other countries, you know, take a lot of lead from what we do uh, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a country in terms of what we do. And, you know, the plant industry is worth over four billion to the, to the UK economy. Um, the, the CPA is the leading trade association for this sector in the UK. And Currently, CPA members supply some around about 85% of hired, plight, uh, hired plant to the construction industry. Now, CPA uh, terms and conditions, um, they're one set of terms and conditions, and this is obviously what I will be focusing on today. There are other higher terms and conditions out there, 
um, and you know such as IPATH and HAE you know and obviously talking about for MUPS in that sense but these are what we call model conditions and the most common form of agreement for hiring MUPS and plant in, in the industry uh, and they can be used for anything you know ranging from handheld to tools and you know you know, roll, ride on rollers, dumpers, up to multi, multi million pound cranes. So, you know, it's, it's quite a broad brush of uh, 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 sort of cover they call. The model conditions govern the risk essentially between the owner and the hirer, and in particular, covering the risk with regard to damage to that plant and loss arising from it. So, as a result, you know, it's important that both owners and hirers understand, you know, when and for what responsibilities they have under these model conditions. And as I said, I'm guilty. You know, we booked a holiday. You know, you know, a couple of years ago, didn't particularly look at the the small, you know, the the, the short, you know, the small print. And you sometimes wonder, you know, what can what can we actually be affected? So let's let's go through this. So um, the key benefits of being a member of a CPA, and I appreciate some of you in this in this um, webinar will be CPA members, is the right to hire out plants and equipment under these model conditions. Now these conditions themselves, what we call model conditions, in one form or another, have been in place for well over 40 years now. Um, they are robust. They have been tried and tested in courts, uh, including the House of Lords. Um, so they're found to be sound, and they're used as, as we expect for business-to-business -business activities. Now there are two sets of, of consumer conditions, plant supplied with an operator and, and without an operator. Um, and these conditions are used when dealing with the general public. CPM critically though, CPA members can use only only CPA members, sorry, can only can use CPA model conditions, um, and these are widely regarded for plant hire agreements. Now they are considered to be both fair to the hire company and the customer, and they clarify what each party's responsibilities are. Now the reality is that these have been constructed really to look after the rental company, the owner. Um, yet, in some respects, be fair to the contractor. So, be mindful of that. That you know, generally speaking, they're looking after the owner of the of the plant. They're the ones that have invested in in the equipment. Um, as with any types of def, uh, um, conditions, you're going to get some definitions. And and it'd be fair to say it'd be it'd be daft of me not to go through this, because if I refer to something a little bit later on, then you won't know or understand what I'm I'm really sort of reflecting upon. So, owner. So, for the purpose of today's webinar. AFI Uplift are the owner. We own the, the MUBE. The hirer um, includes, you know, obviously the company, the firm, the person, corporation, whatever. But it also includes any successors or personal representatives, representatives, or even if they're taken over by another company. So, like we've seen in the past, companies unfortunately, um, you know, go go bankrupt. The responsibility for any hire then passes on to the people that buy them, um, and any machines that are generally on rehire. Um, so we, you know, we, we, you know, we could have machines on rehire are generally agreed separately in writing. Contract for the benefit of this webinar, this is between the owner and the hirer um, of, of the machine. Now, plant itself, um, and you'll see within the, the model conditions, they, they, they don't say excavator, they don't say crane, they don't say mupe, they say, you know, plant. So, essentially, plant is any equipment which has been supplied. So, yeah, we can go from a drill uh, up to, uh, you know, multi-million pound cranes, as I said earlier. From a mupe perspective, it can cl include all sorts of aspects of the machine, so ancillaries that we have on the machine, such as generators, inverters, uh, pipe stands, cradle stands, you know, anything that is used and supplied with the machine. So when a machine is delivered to you on site, um, and I've heard of this in the industry before where, you know, a customer said, you know, a generator, uh, sorry, a uh, owner has said the generator is fitted to the machine and you, you know, you, you then suddenly receive a bill for a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds because the generator wasn't there. At that point, you know, you, you kind of question, well, was it actually fitted to the machine? So we'll go through some of these little sort of uh, potential issues a little bit later on. Working day, you know, fairly self-explanatory in, in that sense. Um, there is a bit of a clause in in there for if anything ever changes to a, a typical working day, um, but not to, to, to worry too much about that. Higher period, um, many people are unaware that the higher starts for most plant um, the moment the machine leaves the owner's depot. Uh, and doesn't finish until the machine actually returns to the depot. So in this case, you know, we've we've loaded a machine in our depot, you know, our London depot. We've 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 loaded it. it, it, it as it as it actually leaves the gate, it's actually on hire to yourselves. Um, 
and there has been occasions before where you know issues have happened on the on on the transit roads machines have fallen off you know not not, not just for our company for many companies um you know in 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 the in the 10 years or uh, i've been with AFI, um, you know, we, we have had issues, um, you know, where things have happened, but you've got to look at that in, 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 it, in its uh, entirety, and what you tend to find is that most higher companies, you generally speaking, you have to pick up the pieces yourself, you can't suddenly go on to you as our customer and say, well, it's fell off on the, you know, the, the M25, it wasn't even on your site. Consumer contract, uh, just to be clear, we do not hire um, to private individuals, we do company to company. Um, we don't go down that route, um, and you'll find that you know. Of course, you can go, walk into a, a tool hire company and hire a, a drill over the, you know, the holiday period to go and do whatever you want to do with it. Yeah. So, talking of holiday periods, as identified, it just covers the, uh, the you know, the the stop of work over Easter, Christmas, New Year, as well as any public or, or bank holidays. So, fairly self-explanatory. Okay, right, so before we go any further, um, I'm just going to ask a, a couple of questions, and, and this is where really I want a little bit of interaction from your good selves, yeah? So, you know, um, a machine causes damage to a third-party wall on site. The MUP is in good order and being operated by a trained and competent operator. Who is responsible? So I'm just going to launch a poll. You should be able to see the poll now, um, and what I want you to do, just click on, on the one that you think um, is, um, is the right answer there. Okay, five seconds, four, three, two, one. Okay, right, great. Okay, I'll close that one. Okay, now move on to the next um, question. And you just have to forgive me because I have to just go onto this system that we have. So who is responsible if the MUP is stolen? So you'll see now another poll. It's only four questions, uh, ladies and gents. So who is responsible if the MUP is stolen? So it's obviously on site, um, and and it's uh, you know, and we've had this, we've had this in the in the last month, you know, where we've turned up to collect a machine um, to find that the thing is not there. Um, okay, I think that's it. I've got hundred percent there. I can see when you've got hundred percent. So participation. All right. So I know it's early in the morning. It is for me as well. Um, I'll just move on to the next question. Uh, right, okay. Just to, so you can read that one now. So machines cause damage to a third-party wall on site. Um, oh, hang on, I've just jumped back to the wrong one. Apologies. I know what's happened there. Sorry, let me just jump past. You have damaged the up on site. Um, when do you have to notify the owner of the damage? Okay. So I've got 100%. It was, it was kind of uh, interesting in the first question. People were changing their minds, which I can see on here. So... Um, and it's done jump back to question three again and question four um quite a simple one how many days are you responsible for the machine after you have off hired it okay no nope, we've got some changes going now I'll give you 10 seconds. So you know the score. Friday night, you've finished on site. Bring that higher company and get it off hired, will you? And that's what ten, tends to happen. And then, uh, yeah, we turn up on site. And, uh, you know, various things can happen, can't, to a machine over the weekend. All right, I'm going to close them polls then. Thank you. All right, jump back to question one again. I think I must have a sensitive mouse today. 
Okay, right. Well, hopefully we're going to answer some of these um, during the, during this, and uh, you know, hopefully we can see see what uh, what comes up. So, extent of the contract. Remember, the contract is with the hire. So, our contract is is with your good selves. No other person can make a claim against the company based on the terms of the contract. Our contract is with your good selves. So, strictly between AFI and you, the hirer. This allows the hirer then, if it's bought by another company then they take over the machines and then they then become responsible um, as the hirer. So you can't enforce your own terms and conditions later on and all that sort of things. Now, one of the things that in terms of this is, um, is um, you know, acceptance of plants on site. The last, in, in contract law, the last piece of paperwork is deemed to be um, the, the, the last, the, the, the legal piece of paperwork. Now, most hire companies, and I'm talking broadly, I've worked, worked for quite a few, are wary, and, and I'm being very open with you now, of written customer orders which state that the hire is under, you know, their terms and conditions, and we're always wary of it. Um, we get our contracts, uh, you know, our terms and conditions back with CPA scrolled out, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to ABC contract terms. Well, that doesn't work in that sense, yeah? Um, not for us, anyway. When this happens, you'll find that most of us will write back in writing and state that the hire will take place under CPA terms and conditions. It protects you as well as ourselves. Um, and, you know, when the proverbial does it, the fan, and unfortunately it does, um, you know, you need to make sure that you've got the right, you know, people in place um, to protect you. Right. One of the issues, one of the main issues that we have in this industry, you know, and, and what are you responsible for when, when, when it arrives? You've, 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 you know, you've hired the machine, whatever the size of the machine, small, big, large, wheeled, tracked, it pushes, um, you know, it's got outriggers, it's got, it's got stabilizers, you know, it's it's been delivered, and and often it's delivered at you know early in the morning, middle of the afternoon, things are going on site and such and whatnot. So and these things happen, and we appreciate this, right? Um, and I've seen machines delivered in the middle of the night, and you sometimes mindful that these things are, are, are you know you know what what happened when it was being delivered. You as a hire are responsible to ensure that there is an unobstructed access and egress to the loading areas. Uh, for that's for loading and for unloading and of course when we collect the machine and unless otherwise agreed in writing for any unload and loading the machine must be made available you the hire are also responsible for any damage caused at the point of the loading and unloading so for example if the machine falls off the side of the loading vehicle or if there's an impact into a structure so they might imagine it's coming down the ramps there um, and it runs away and and and, and um, you know load you know buries itself into a building, uh, you're responsible for that damage at that time. I must remind you it's your responsibility to have a safe and suitable area for all loading and loading activities. This also includes, for example, when you, you're loading and unloading by your own means. So, for example, a forklift. I've seen, I've uh, been to investigations where machines have dropped on the, onto the, onto the uh, ground uh, when the fork truck driver was lifting them on. Uh, I've also had it where cranes, tower cranes have been loading the machines, central London, you know, lowering down onto a truck, you know, and, you know, made contact, you know, with the vehicle and such, yeah? So, there could be all sorts of issues. So, that might be news to you, but even, even that it's our driver carrying out activity, they're effectively your responsibility. Now, under the terms and conditions, they act as a servant or an agent of the hirer, and consequently, anything they would do is regarded as being done by the hirer. Now, this ties into clause 13, which we'll discuss a little bit shortly. And I, you know, I haven't put clause numbers on all these because otherwise you're just going to count down um, and think how many clauses are. there. Um, but we'll, co we'll cover this a little bit later on. So you may think that this is, you know, hang on a sec. The driver's just, you know, tipped it off the side of the truck. He's 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 okay. He was he was one leading the machine, but you know, I've now got ten thousand pounds worth of scissor lift, which I need to get my job done on the side of the of, on the side of the ground. It's now leaking oil and battery acid everywhere. So you might think this is wholly unfair, and you know, and honestly, I can I can understand your point. the The only exception is if you can prove that the driver's actions were negligent in any way, or that he or she was incompetent to carry out that operation. So, to all intents and purposes, it's your responsibility, unless you can prove otherwise. So, again, just trying to make sure. I appreciate you've all got different systems in place. Um, and, and management systems. So I think it would be appropriate at all times to have loading and unloading op operations controlled, marshalled, a safe area, uh, and, and put, you know supervised by your employees. You can see it's being done, uh, and there you can't necessarily get in the way and, and get involved with it. But so uh, if the driver was doing what the hire says, then essentially the damage is your responsibility. 
you know, unchained driver, can you bang it over there, please? And, you know, that's that, that's the instruction that the guy got. Um, delivery and maintenance. So we'll look at clause five. As site managers, supervisors, or, you know, foreman, procurement, you know, you've often specified, ordered, and received machines. And as you know, machines are delivered at varying times throughout the day. But let's question how many times you've had high equipment delivered only to find, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got damage on the machine. Now, sometimes this damage is identified upon delivery, but often it's reported a few days later by your operator, site team, or, you know, by a site inspection. You know, who, who's cracked that guardrail? You know, who, who, who smashed, you know, who smashed the wheel? You know, but when you often question people, how often have you had it come to it? I said, well, it was like that when it was delivered. Okay. My point is that damage is, 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 is my point is damage is, is damage. It's got to be identified um, as soon as possible. And often it is identified at the end of the hire period, which is too late. The hire under, the, under clause five cannot claim that the, the damage was like that when it was delivered unless they have contacted the hire company. Um, and we, we have it within three, high, three days of the hire start. All right, so you know, you've got to point out the damage. Now, if we supply an operator, one of our truck divisions, then you've got four days. One initiative we have taken uh, is delivery drivers now take before and after photographs, uh, and and this has significantly reduced uh, you know issues in this area. Um, the other issue uh, potentially is um, is where there is a fault, a design fault. Um, or something that which you know couldn't have been seen at the time. Now we appreciate your um, your you know your your teams are not service engineers and mechanics. So if by design there's a fault in the machine, you know you wouldn't you you could never be held responsible for that because you, to all intents and purposes you wouldn't know you know that the machine was supposed to have you know this this you know defect on it. Um, the hire is also responsible uh, for keeping uh, the machine. In a, in a safe state and it's used correctly. So one of the things that you would expect, of course, and if I use IPATH as an example, that the, that the operator is competent. And it's got to be returned as delivered. We accept that there's going to be fair wear and tear. Um, but then, of course, then the next thing you've got is a bit of what we call negligence. So as you know, under health and safety law, you have a, you know, you have a duty to provide training and also familiarize your operators on work equipment, which includes MUPS. Failure to provide a trained operator to operate the machine could, ver could be very costly in terms of liability of the machine, but also in terms of risk of harm. And when I men mention the word harm, those of you in the room that will know this, is the health and safety sentencing guidelines. So it doesn't necessarily have anything have to have been hurt, injured, it's the potential for harm, and these new sentencing guidelines can have massive implications uh, on, on companies. All right, so we'd expect battery machines to be charged up, we'd expect diesel machines to have diesel in them, um, and many, many occasions where collection has failed because the hirer, you know, has run the machine, you know, dry of juice, there's no p power in the batteries, um, and, you know, we then either got to go and get an engineer to come in to bleed the system, or you've got to charge the machine up, um, which effectively, um, you know, renders, renders the collection, um, you know, null and void. Um, you'll find that you may get a charge for aborted deliveries and such like that. So the hire also as well, you've got a responsibility to inspect the machine before each use. And of course, if there's a fault on the machine, um, report, the, report the fault immediately. The hire, though, if you continue to use it, then you are then going to be responsible for any damage or accidents as a result of continuing to use it. How many times you may have seen, you know, guys that are doing, um, you know, um, painting or, you know, plastering or fire fire uh, protection. There's all sorts of, um, you know, gubbing that sort of gets in all over the controls. The fact that you have maybe, you know, covered a decal, uh, which is a sign on the machine, on the controller, you know, potentially there, that could be, you know, catastrophic to an operator. Uh, and, of course, you've got issues in terms of, you know, uh, if there's a leak of hydraulic oil and you've used it for several days in that condition, then you know you don't come back, you know, shouting at us about the the floor condition that you've damaged. Of course, we're going to uh, supply the thorough examinations and, and, and any sort of pre-delivery inspections, um, and, and you would expect companies like ourselves to have strict procedures in place to ensure that we do not send out a machine that's not got its thorough examination in place. Ground and site. Okay, so as a hirer, you are deemed to have uh, knowledge of your site and property or the land where the MUP is going to be delivered and used. Um, as a hirer, you warrant the condition of that site or place of delivery. 
uh, and in such saying that the machine is suitable for that ground. So you've got to consider not only ground like the picture shows there, but also floor loadings, you know, you know multi-level floor loadings, make sure that it's safe to take it. If in your opinion, um, the ground is soft or unsuitable for the muke to work on, to travel, be transported across, then you've got to supply suitable timbers. Now it says timbers, it's suitable supports. It could be road track, it could be trackway, it could be all sorts of materials that you know we can do to you know make the machine, uh, ensure the machine is, is safe and, and sound. Um, and you've got to lay them in a suitable manner to ensure the machine can be uh, you know traversed across properly. If we supply any uh, timbers, um, or anything like that, um, they are provided solely to assist you as the hire it into your duties. So, and it, that does not expressly relieve you of your legal, regulatory, or contractual obligations. So, we might have lent you something to say, well, yeah, we'll use this to get up, get the machine across there. You know, that's you, that's still your responsibility. Um, you're also responsible for the protection and liable for any damage to any above or below ground services, which includes cables, ducting, water pipes, gas lines, etc. But also things like you wouldn't necessarily think pavements, you know, car parks, bridges, tunnels, uh, or anything that's adjacent to the site as well, because you know, things can have a, you know a, a, an effect on other types of, of ground. So. To all intents and purposes, then, you're responsible for ensuring the ground is suitable for delivery, collection, and of course, use of the machine. Now, if we, as an owner of the machine, carry out a site survey on your behalf, then the responsibility switches to us, unless within our site survey, we exclude the condition of the ground in our survey recommendations. I've been to do site surveys before, carry out site survey, only to find that somebody said, well, I can't tell you what's under there because I haven't got any plans. So I will just, you know, put on my drawing, in my information, my camera, you know, that I cannot survey the ground, but that should warrant further investigation to make sure it can take the weight of the machine. And then, of course, I would supply the point loads, uh, gross weight of the machine, um, and any sort of dynamic side of things. Um, it also uh, covers the fact that if we supply pads for use on our machines, again, we do not relieve the hire of their responsibility. You've still got to make sure that the, you know, the outrigger pad is sufficient. Um, and of course, ground conditions, site conditions, you can see in the picture there is a pavement. You're going to be responsible for obtaining any permits from local authorities or highway agencies. So the hiring of plant. Um, if you know, if an op uh, in terms of liability of a driver or an operator when they're supplied, if the operator or a driver supply with the plant uh, is required, then the operator is competent of the operation uh, of that machine. Uh, significantly, the operator is deemed to be under the direction again and control of the hirer. If the operator is competent, the hirer is responsible for the operator's negligence in operating the plant. So we're not going to supply, you know, our truck division, we're not going to supply you an incompetent or, you know, unsuitably trained operator to operate a 34, 38, 57 meter truck. So effect, to all intents and purposes, we're working for your good selves. Um, in terms of this, again, remember what we said earlier, the truck driver, you know, the, the load and loading, these, you know, truck drivers or operators, again, in connection with their employment, but working on the MUP, be regarded as a servant or agent of the hirer. Um, the hirer shall be solely responsible for all claims arising in connection with the operation of the MUP by the drivers, operators, and persons. So we, we do need quite a bit of supervision sometimes, you know, and, and, and what happened at what point. Persons um, it, permitted to operate the plant. In situations uh, where the hirer uh, allows somebody to operate the plant, that hirer shall not allow other persons to operate that plan without the owner's uh, written consent. So let's just say, to all intents and purposes, we've supplied you a, you know, big big track mounted machine. We've brought, you know, you've you've hired it with an operator. The operator has to nip out to the, you know, gun gun, uh, answer the call of nature, and somebody jumps in the machine. Because you've oper you've hired it with an operator, nobody else is allowed to operate the machine. And equally, our operator is not allowed to go and operate any of your equipment. So, you know, oh, I'll jump on the forklift and just move that for you. Again, it's a big no-no, yeah? Um, that can happen, I will say, but it has to be agreed in writing. We need authorization, etc. In terms of claims, um, within our truck mounted division, as I said, we'll always, depend, you know, depending on the size of the, the, the truck, provide an operator with the MUP. Uh, and again, if we do, remember these are highly trained operators um, and they're both familiar with the machine. However, if there is an accident or damage caused by the operator, then it is regarded as the hire's responsibility. 
and it's also regarded the operator as effectively your employee. And that's why a lot of when we when we do the, the truck uh, side of things, we have um, damage waiver and all risk. Okay, this covers you know, basically helps to cover some of the costs in, included. Okay, um, breakdowns. Um, you know, any breakdown, no matter what it is unsatisfactory working or damage, must be notified immediately to the owner, and this must be confirmed in writing. And moreover, we have to acknowledge it. So if you're going to notify a breakdown at 5.30 on any evening, it's potentially not going to be seen until the next day. Um, the owner, essentially, um, in terms of downtime, we avoid consequential loss, um, such as loss of profit, provided the plant is in good working order and the operator is competent. Um, so if, if, um, if for, for example, we've, we've hired a machine, the machine has, has broken down, the machine is in good working order, machines do break down, then you know breakdown time will only be considered from the time and date at which that written notific notification is received and acknowledged by the owner. We will not pay other companies for, for you know for, for equipment that stood idle. For example a crane stood idle, you know, a steel erecting uh, contract. It's higher as responsibility. Um, we are responsible for breakdowns due to fair wear and tear, but uh, we are not responsible for consequential loss from the higher or third parties. Bad weather um, you know, for, for stoppages signed, you know, we, we live in the UK, we know the score, um, you know, we cannot be held responsible for this, it's out of our control. Um, I, I do accept that sometimes commercial decisions are taken, but that is always at a director's level. Um, and we've seen, you know, again, we've seen many cases before where, you know, uh, you know, tyres and things like that have, have been re re um, changed incorrectly by um, hirers, wrong, wrong type of tyre, wrong grade of tyre massive effect stability on the machine so you know we accept um, that tires will you know will get changed um, but you know if we're going to if we're going to do that we are going to be responsible for it we need an order number from your good cells and, and we'll make sure that the tire is replaced at the right time um, you're also going to as you would expect be um, responsible for cost due to damage and vandalism um, we've had quite a few over the years I remember once a couple of, a couple of you know good sort of five six years being woken at two in the morning, I was on standby at the time, and only to be told we had two 45-foot um, booms driving into each other in a car park uh, in Tesco's down in Wales. Uh, I live in Leeds. I didn't know what I could do from that point in time, but of course it's higher it's higher as responsibility. You know, they left the keys in the machines, um, so you appreciate the amount of damage that was uh, that was caused there. Um, I think the, the the policeman said they were jousting. But, uh, there you go. Um, in the terms and conditions, it was also referenced to more than one machine hired as a unit. Um, and, and if you've ever seen that, it's it's relevant. All the machines are, have link controls. It, generally speaking, these are for a very specific task, and it's extremely rare. Uh, owners and, hi and hirers liability side of things. So um, if we, in terms of um, things that are out of our our reasonable control. If we didn't directly cause the problem through our actions or inactions, then, then put simply, we are not uh, liable. Um, we will not accept any claim for loss other than to credit the hire of the machine for the time it was broken down. And again, that's going to be under you know wear and tear. Um, the hire will all be, always be responsible for safe use of the hired plant. And again, remind you that you're liable for the damage or injury caused by your operators as negligence. Okay, so making sure the person that's operated the machine is trained. Only last week we had one of our spider type machines uh, involved in a tip over incident where an operator uh, um, used the machine and then somebody who wasn't trained used the machine after that and that caused a you know a serious serious incident. Thankfully nobody injured, but you know these things do happen. Okay, um, the hirer will pay for any damages to the machine and claims from third parties from the use of the machine, uh, including damage and injury. Um, as a hirer, you're also responsible for damage to any property. Um, this also covers any claims while collecting and, uh, and delivering, except on the public highway, um, unless we've been directed to load and load on the public highway. So sometimes we'll get to the site, you haven't got a safe area for us to unload, and you'll then go and tell us, yeah, you've got to unload on the road. Um, that can all sorts of issues happen happen there. Whilst the machine has been repaired, the hire will pay generally a reduced rate for the hire of the machine, uh, and normally it's the two thirds of the hire rate. Um, and generally speaking, this applies to vehicle mounted platforms. Um, the hire is not responsible for a damage or claims whilst the machine is being transported by us or being transported 
uh, on the public highway. Um, again, you, very little you can do in that situation. Notification of accidents. Um, you've got to you've got to notify us immediately of any accidents or incidents and confirm the details in writing. And this, of course, includes you know damage to uh, property and of course injuries to people. Um, it must be done within 24 hours. It's critical on that in that side of things. Uh, I can also I can say all from experience. All too often we found out too late, and this hampers any any issues, investigations, and such. Um, and the hire cannot promise any payments to a third party on our behalf without our written consent. So you know the machine's you know been working away, and you know it's gone and you know damaged somebody's wall. You know oh the machine you know it moved on its own, it ran on. I've been, I've been to all them type of investigations. You know again we will never 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 pay out um, without our written consent. Uh, rehiring. Um, in terms of that, the hirer cannot sublet or lend or hire the machine to anyone else without our permission. Um, and the hirer cannot take the machine to another site uh, unless we agreed. Um, we've had machines before um, where, you know, as you would expect, that you know, there's, there's four machines on site uh, and there's, there's 30 contractors on there. You know, people jump on them to go and use them. Um, if essentially, it's lending, isn't it? Um, um, but I will tell you now that the onset of these smart cards now, um, you'll see from you know future machines you won't be able to do that because it will only be authorised users that can use that piece of equipment. Um, and also we've had machines that have been taken off site to be taken to another site. Um, essentially, it's uh, it's moving the machine without our consent, so that can cause no end of issues when we're trying to collect and recover our machines. Um, returning the plant for repairs. If the machine needs repairs, you know, generally speaking, we can carry out on site. We've got a lot of experience uh, and very, very good service engineers. However, if we're unable to fix that machine, then it may have to be removed from site for repairs. Um, when this happens, we we will replace the machine with another machine if we can. If we can't, then the hire is given the option to either terminate the hire contract unless the repairs are due to the hirer's damage. All right, so in this case, you will have to pay two thirds of the higher rate until the machine is repaired. So, you know, a repair that could take, you may have overloaded the, the, the boom example, cause catastrophic damage to the machine. Um, it might take one of the manufacturers, you know, a month to, month to arrange, you know, the new boom coming in or slew ring or anything like that. You will be paying two thirds of that rate at that time. Uh, and also, don't forget, you've probably got to hire another machine to carry on with the job that you were doing. So it can be quite a costly uh, side, side of it. Um, often, when that machine is taken then to the hirers or to the sorry to the manufacturers to be repaired, who pays and for collect and return the machine after it's been repaired? Basically, if the machine has been repaired after hirers damaged it, then the hirer is going to pay it. If the repairs though were fair wear and tear, then you know we would bear that cost as as, as AFI. So you know we, we will always try and meet you wherever we can. But you know again we uh, we make sure that we you know things are reasonable. The basis of charging, as you would expect, um, I've, I've you know if requested, the hirer must tell the owner how many hours that you know the machine has actually worked. The reality is that yeah we've got our you know we've got our clocks on the machine and generally speaking you can see you can see it. Um, the hire should really keep t to the eight hours Monday to Thursday and seven hours Friday. Um, and as I said, with the advent of this new smart card and machine telematics, it's going to come in the future where the machines can be isolated by ourselves when required. So we could switch the machines off you know in, in few years time. Um, when it becomes more prevalent in the industry, you could switch the machines off at five o'clock on a Friday night and make them start at eight o'clock on a Monday morning, should you want. So there are the, uh, some of the issues that you know we, we are getting as an industry. The, um, so this, um, as it says, this will make sure that you know things are um, reimbursed properly. Okay, downtime to punch and replacement. You know, it's got to have two hours. We we, we always try and get there in time. Um, but again, we won't reimburse you uh, for any consequential loss arising from a breakdown. Okay. Um, as we charge in, in days, then part days, start and finish, these days are generally charged as full days. Again, these are you know open to commercial decisions in that sense. The hire is responsible for punctures, but can ask to be charged at two-third rates after two hours. Generally speaking, this is on the truck mount side of things. Okay, so if something's gone down on, on site, you may, you know, you're trying to you're trying to get a truck tire. It can often take longer than two hours to get, a, you know, a new tire there. 
Uh, plant rates, okay, um, it's in there. Full days are charged unless agreed on uh, on hire. Saturday and Sunday, where we generally, you know, you often find that, you know, Sundays are generally speaking, you know, we, we accept that the machines are going to be used. Um, there's no charge for weekend unless the plant is worked. Weekly and monthly rate is charged irrespective of hours worked. Um, and all in rates will be charged the minimum agreed price regardless of the hours worked. You get suspensions as you expect over the Christmas period, over Easter, etc. So we, you know we accept that. There's no point in having, you know bringing all the machines back into into the depots. Often it's uh, it's carried out uh, you know where the machines are kept kept uh, in in the end. Okay, um, the higher start date is the day the machine is delivered. If the machine is used to be used that day. So essentially, in in other sense, um, it's deli you know it's the higher start date was. Um, let's say t tomorrow, 31st of March, and today it's the 30th of March. We've delivered it today. You're on site and you use it today. Essentially, the highest start date will will start today. Um, it, sometimes, again, we agree delivery early, um, and that's often sometimes to help you out, to help us out, to make sure that your guys and, and girls are able to operate. You know, first. If it is agreed to transfer the machine to another site. Um, only a maximum of one day suspension is allowed when that transfer takes place. Okay, so um, and that does happen quite often. When the machine is off hired, um, we must make the machine available to collect during normal working hours. If not, then we can put the machine back on hire and charge any transport costs back to you as a hirer. Um, the hirer, you know, me obviously, then must clean uh, and decontaminate the machine before we collect it from site. Um, we have, you know. M countless issues in terms of machines that come back to us that are absolutely full to the gunnels with all sorts of kit. One of the most important issues, of course, is things like asbestos, which we've had issues with in the past. Um, so, you know, we accept sometimes they're going to be used in these environments, but we would accept that, you know, we, we, you know, we ask you for clean certificates and, and decontamination uh, certificates. Okay, so what about termination? You're responsible for the plant for seven days after off-hire. Okay, um, we hire on an agreed period. Uh, plus price they are thereafter okay so um, and we do accept off hires by phone and when that does happen you'll be given an official hire number off hire number but you the, you must remain uh, un and understand that you're responsible for this machine for a further three days if it isn't available within those seven days then you become responsible for a th further three days so you know I've gone you know we've, we've gone to sites before where you know it's still in the you know the basement of the machine and you know the crane can't get it up it goes back on higher to you all right so just be, just be mindful of that um, and charges obviously in incurred if the hire cancels a contract on the day of delivery so we delivered the machine that day and you've got you know you suddenly you guys have been you know had an issue you're not going to site you want to cancel the contract you're going to get charged for it Fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, in terms of uh, idle time, other charges and transport, um, if the machine works at any time in the normal working week, it's still the minimum period and no idle time right is accepted. Only after the minimum period would this be then considered. Um, and this is to allow for things like operators and driver's expenses consumable items oils fuels and stuff it also um, covers us for things unfortunately when your operators just, uh, decide to put diesel in a hydraulic tank um, which happens quite frequently um, you, uh, you know that can be hundreds and hundreds up to thousands of pounds and it obviously covers us for costs like you know for transportation um, we also have uh, quite a few issues and I'm Kind of letting you know this, yeah. But where, where unfortunately people tend to emblazon the machines with your your higher your names, you know. So ABC Contracting, oh, there's four of their machines. I can tell because it's got it written all over the side of it. Um, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, you probably know that. Um, but but you know, be mindful that chances are you may get charged for the repainting and re you know re making making good what is bad. Um, you wouldn't do it to a car, would you? Hire a car, you wouldn't put your name on the car. So you know why why should you do it to to our equipment? Um, and sometimes again, you know, we may we may ask um, yourselves, you know, for for transport side of things, you know, where we have we have to arrange um, external haul yes to, to 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 haul in the machine because of where it is. There's been occasions before where it's been taken to sites so deep that you can't actually get the, get get the thing out without specialist contractors. Okay, government regulations um, that own our land. Um, obviously, in terms of law regulations, health and safety. That's going to be the responsibility of the hirer. 
if the hire breaks that rule and it's not AFI, then the machine is on hire to you. The only exception here is if we um, move the machine onto the road by the customer, uh, for, for the customer. Um, so what I mean by that is why would we do that? It basically protects us, us if the hire is, is uh, if we get notice that the hire is, uh, is in trouble and can't pay their bills, if you know what I mean, um, then that machine cannot be seized by a third party to hold against payments. So we've had it before where we've gone in to collect machines, put them on the road, ready for us to collect later on. Um, and of course you can't use the machine as a deposit against loans or anything like that or, or, or bad debts. If the hirer goes bust, fails to make payments or breaches any part of the contract, we can end the contract immediately and recover the machine. We still retain the right to recover any money owed and incurred as per terms of the uh, of the agreement, all right, because in terms of you, you, you're non-paying non and you're breaking the terms and conditions. Um, normal working week, five days, 39 hour a week, excluding breaks, um, uh, holidays and such. Um, if there is a change to normal working week, for example, four day week, but it's still 39 hours, then the contract can be flexible to accommodate the change and the new working week would then be agreed. Uh, but four days would still be equal to five days regarding higher charges. So it's quite a, quite a straight one. We would agree that with you. Uh, disputes, um, how are they dealt with? Um, the place of hire determines the law that applies. So England and, and, and Scotland and such, yeah? And this sets out who will nominate the independent adjudicator should AFI and the hire agree to any dispute being resolved uh, by arbitration. Um, so generally speaking, uh, dis dis uh, disputes can be referred to the adjudicator, which is generally CPA. Um, and both, you know, if both parties agree to arbitration, then they are bound by the decision of that independent uh, adjudicator. The alternative, and, or, or the alternative to that is obviously to go through the courts, which can be, you know, costly and, and, and messy. Um, uh, and obviously, us as owners then can still make additional charges um, for any late payments. And that adjudicator's decision is final and binding. Okay. Obviously, in terms, I say late, late payment charges. You know, again, you know, it's interest. It's all sorts of things. In terms of severability, um, the hirer uh, pays for any fines incurred by the owner, um, which protects the owner. Um, if any of the uh, clauses that are in the terms and conditions are found to be unlawful, void, or unenforceable, then the clause will be deemed severable and will not affect the validity, uh, the validity of the enforceability of the remaining clauses. And this is to the extent that's permitted by law. Okay, adjudication, which I mentioned earlier, is rapid, it's cost-effective, uh, and it's a means of resolution with, with the decision being given within 28 days. Um, it's also a lot simpler and a lot more cost effective, you know, than going through the courts. Uh, you tend, you know, sometimes we do stick to our guns, but you know, you're gonna, you're gonna find that you probably wish you'd gone through the the, uh, the CPA adjudicator. Okay, so what we've discussed today then is some of the standard hire terms and conditions in the plant hire industry, um, and only CPA terms apply. Um, uh, and an acceptance of plant on site implies acceptance of all terms and conditions. So if you've signed for the machine, you've accepted the T's and C's. The higher responsibility for loading and loading, safekeeping, knowledge of ground, site conditions, operation of the equipment, etc. The fact that you've got to notify us immediately um, of any accidents and in writing within 24 hours, um, and incidents, of course. You remember, you can't lend the machine or take the machine to another site without our permission. Um, we will allow you to take the machine to another site, but we've got to know because it's our it's it's our piece of equipment. How the charges and rates are calculated, uh, the higher pe higher rate period, terminations, um, changes and government regulations. Obviously, you know the uh, Article 50 chain uh, was signed yesterday, so you no know, no end of issues may happen there. In, in, you know, in government regulations in in the near future, and I'm sure that will all come out. And of course, disputes and and severability. So, um, I'm just going to go back to your um, your, your questions, um, and, and um, so a machine causes damage to a third party's wall and site, you put in good order, and being operated by a trained and competent person, who is responsible? So, if I just get the poll up, I just want to uh, go through that, and if you could just answer, or have, have another go, see what you think now. So, if you could just answer them. All right, so, yep, 
100%, you're all right, it is the hirer. Well done. There was a big change earlier. Earlier on, we had operator being responsibility, and we even had the owner. It's not our responsibility, it's your responsibility. So it's on site in your place, it's going to be your responsibility. Well done. More fingers and thumbs today, so just bear me one second. So who is responsible if the MUP is stolen? All right. We had one we had some people earlier mention the site manager. He's probably going to get a kick in if the machine's gone missing, but you know, often in, in some respects uh, it's not always his fault. Um, and also as well we had owner earlier. It's not again, it's not our responsibility if it, it's stolen. Um, Interestingly, people never said last operator earlier, and that's the same now. So, so well done. That's good. Well done. Oh, don't be, see, it's gone back again, again. Fingers and thumbs. So, you've damaged the MUP on site. When do you have to notify us uh, of the damage? All right, think about it. When do you have to notify us of the damage? Give you five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Just conscious of time, so I'll close that there. Okay, it's immediately. You've got to you've got to notify us immediately. Okay, so um, and then of course then you'll put it in writing. And again, the damage to you might not be so much as damage to you know to other people. Um, but yeah, so if you've damaged something, you've got to take it. Uh, take it on the chin and sometimes let us know as soon as possible. Um, and how many days are you responsible for the machine after you've off-hired it? Might help if I launch it. Great. We had quite a number of you put one day earlier. Um, so everybody voted you're not all voted I can see the polls okay yep all voted now all right so you are responsible for seven days okay so I'll close that now all right but generally speaking you've all improved there which which is really good and it's only just a a, a little tongue-in-cheek type thing so yeah so if I just go through that now the hire is responsible the hirer, sorry, yes, you are responsible. Um, you have to notify us immediately, and you are responsible for the machine for seven days. Okay. Um, now, I just have a quick look at, um, and you just have to forgive me while I just make something you can't see on your on your on your screen. When a MUP is, is used for stripping out AIB panels, how do you ensure it's been cleaned down properly before it goes on rehire, goes out on a rehire? All right, from our, um, thanks Graham. Um, from our, if, if it's been, um, so I'm presuming you're talking about asbestos panels there, insulating. Um, in terms of that, when it goes on hire, we, Generally speaking, we don't know who it's going to. We have a general inkling of what, um, what you know, what the, what the company that we're hiring it to is going to to be doing, um, and what we will generally ask for is a clean down certificate at the end of it. Um, and if they've they've issued and pro provided us with a clean down certificate, then we are then you know happy to say that that is being cleaned down. We did fall foul of this a couple of years ago, um, which I was involved with, and that was a, a, a you know, even the HSC got involved with it, where it was um, blue asbestos in the machine, um, and that was from a from a, a demolition company who didn't tell us what they were doing. Michael's asked, um, what are the hirer's main risks when hiring MUPs? And that's a really good question, and hopefully I've I identified it. He obviously asked the question a little bit earlier on, but we're clearly loading and loading. You know, often it's unsupervised. Um, and you know, don't forget main opportunity really to have a look at the machine and view the machine, have a wander around it. We are getting so many more people now 
where you know mute managers, mute coordinators are taking pictures of the machines to make sure that you know when it comes back, you know it goes out on it on, on its uh, you know it's arrived on your site. Your guys taking the photos when it's gone out into the into the project and it comes back ready to be collected. Hopefully you can stand there and say you know it was uh, it, you know it is in good op in good order. Uh, obviously operating the mute after a defect has been identified. So if you've identified a defect. You know, get it get it reported quickly. That way, then you're going to you know protect yourself should something go wrong. Uh, obviously, failing to operate the, the mute properly. You know, make sure that tr operators trained. Make sure they're familiarised, um, and make sure that you know they're operating it safely. You know, we know we know the good operators. We know the guys who'll, and girls who'll take a little bit of a shortcut and a risk. Obviously, theft is a main is a major risk. You're going to resp be responsible for that. You know, where it was parked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, and of course damage to third parties um, to the mute so I think you could all probably you know take some take some solace here from you know when you when you leave a machine often on a um, you know often on a on a on a Friday night and you get back on a Friday on a Monday morning is it where it was left uh, and we tend to find people have jumped on the machines over the weekend to, to use it okay I think that's all my questions I can't see any more questions oh hang on I've got another one here if I am responsible seven days after a half hire, when is a machine reared out, rehired out by? If I, if I responsible. Right. So, uh, Vincent just asked a question there. If if I am responsible seven days after off hire, what if the machine is rehired out? By another user, I think, uh, uh, by other use, I think. Um, we would always make sure that the machine comes back to our depot. We do very, very few site-to-site -site, um, hires, so it would come back unless it's, you know, critical. And you might find because it's on the same site, so commercially it makes sense. We would send an engineer out, and they would have a full PDI of the machine to make sure that the machine is safe for use. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, all our machines come back to our depot. Re, you know the P, the the post hire inspected, and then PDI'd, pre delivery inspection, and then ready ready for uh, a, another hire. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we do get a lot in the industry. We do get a lot of site to sites, um, and um, that's often where I find some of the issues in that side. All right, well um, that's the end of the webinar. Um, slightly run over a little bit, but, but probably about five minutes. But hopefully you found it interesting, and useful. What will happen now is this fed this this webinar gets. Um, it has been recorded. It has been run live, times 11:27. All right. So what will happen now is it gets recorded, and then in a couple of days' time, the link gets sent out um, to your good selves. And, and you know, really thank you for for, uh, for for taking the time to listen to it. If you've got any potential webinars that you may think that you know maybe a, a good future webinar, and you want to you know something about it, then please you know let me know. Drop me an email. My email's there. Um, and of course, if you've got any comments or any thoughts, uh, appreciate to hear it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.